Hello and welcome to GGSP. I'm Will and coming up on today's show, we go vroom vroom through the lounge room in Mario Kart Live Home Circuit. Plus, we battle through the remastered ages in Age of Empires 3 Definitive Edition. Now, I've been working on this contraption that will shrink me down so that I can race these carts myself. So let's test it out, shall we? Oh, hang on. Um... Mario Kart has been a Nintendo Titan for nearly 30 years now, and outside of some new tracks and wacky abilities, has remained pretty similar to its first outing. So the question is, how do you shake things up? Whoa! Like this. Mario Kart Live Home Circuit brings the thrill of the race onto your living room floor, and it's surprisingly easy to get that floor into tip-top tarmac shape. Out of the box, you'll get a shiny RC cart, either Mario or Luigi. Atop these carts sits a camera which will allow you to see everything. There's also a set of cardboard gates that you'll need to pop around your room. Once your cart is synced with your Switch, a helpful lackey tool appears to paint your tires. Now just create your track, being sure to enter each gate and loop back through the first. And that's pretty much it. Your living room has become a stage in your very own Mario Kart Cup. And now it's time to warm up those tires for a Grand Tour. Jumping into the Grand Tour mode, you can select from one of Mario Kart's famous cups, with each race popping a snazzy skin over your home tour. From the underwater realm of Cheap Cheap Reef to the spooky darkness of Boo Forest. And it's not just aesthetics, some of them actually come with their own set of challenges. Whoa! Like Tornado Tundra's Weather Troubles, where a tornado can momentarily take control of your cart. <laughs> it's wonderfully surprising just how well the franchise has been translated here. All the visual quirks are present, with an on-screen display and cheeky Mario that always looks very concerned. There's a glowing outline of your painted trail, and floating coins and power-up boxes litter the track, with the expected result once thrown. Though the Power Star won't allow you to pass through furniture, so you'll still need a little bit of skill there. Plus, somewhat unexpectedly, you can still nail the series' trademark drifts. Whilst the physical cart won't, on screen you can hop into a drift and bop out with a boost, which actually gives your cart a sudden pop of speed. But if you don't feel like being beaten by a barrage of Coopers, you can just jump into a time trial. Right, Will? That's right, Will. Hello and welcome to the Good Game Spawn Point test track. Let me take you through it. Running down the tile tarmac, you come up against the blight of the round table. Next, you'll enter the kitchen corner. That's corner with a K. And then make your way through this chair conundrum and round back to the first gate. And we're off. Okay, we've got the R2-D2 coming up here, and oh, we've taken a fall. That's going to be costly. We've got to go around it now. Will is taking through the second gate. Oh, we've knocked a cuff. That could also equally be costly. Oh, and he had a little pause there. That could be costly, but he had a power-up mushroom. He's going along the carpet now. Mario. And across the line. Will, you did it in one minute, five seconds, point six. Hey, that's an entire millisecond off. A PB is a PB. Now, there is actually a surprising amount of things to unlock here. Each cart has its own set of customizable bits and pieces. You can modify gates to bear your desired power up. Plus, all CC cart powers are available to unlock. From the humble 50 CCs, which feels like a snail's pace, to the all powerful 200 CC. No matter what though, your cart looks about 300 times more speedy on screen than it is in real life. After racing for ages, you can actually forget there's an actual race happening in your living room. But whilst there's so much cool crammed into this tech, there's also one big problem. As the cart connects directly to your Switch rather than your home internet, it's got a very short range. 
As you move further and further away, the camera signal will be lost and the cart becomes uncontrollable. So if you're hoping to make courses that run from room to room, know that you'll need to be chasing after your cart. It's pretty crazy tech, so some limitations are to be expected. I will say though, if you've been driving for a while, prepare for your tires to pick up every bit of dirt and dust in your house. And if you have pets, whoa, boat mail, watch out! Outside of swerving around your pets, you can also add some fun, intentional obstacles to your course. Popping in a few little bunny hops makes for a bouncy ride, plus maybe a good tight turn around a barrage of mugs to test your skill. But it's important to remember that your AI opponents will only understand the bare minimum of your track. They'll stick to the surface and drive straight through obstacles. So you'll just be giving yourself additional challenges. But that is the beauty of a level creator, finding your own fun no matter what the game tells you to do. And that's kind of what this game nails. There's potentially endless fun here. So slight tech problems aside, I'm giving Mario Kart Live Home Circuit four and a half out of five rubber chickens. All right, let's get back to racing. Who put this here? <sighs> Only I could find a way to make the Noob Cup juice formula stable enough to deliver it to noobs remotely. Uh, oh, hello there. <laughs> My mic wasn't on for that, was it? <laughs> Welcome to the scoop. It's time to round up some gaming news. Starting off this week with the news that the soundtrack for Untitled Goose Game has been nominated for an ARIA award. Composer Dan Gilding's music for the charming game about a mischievous goose on the loose is nominated for Best Original Soundtrack or Musical Theatre Cast Album. How nice to see the music of one of our locally developed video games getting a shout out. Or should I say, a honk out? <laughs> Our next scoop comes from the Fall Guys Ultimate Knockout Team, who have revealed the game's top five rounds, according to a recent community survey. And, survey says, Slime Climb tops the list, taking the crown for number one favourite stage, followed by Hexagon, Jump Showdown, Season 2 Edition Night Fever, and The Whirly Gig, which came in at number five. Did your favourite make the cut? <laughs> and lastly for this week, news that the next update for Stardew Valley will include local split-screen co-op. While online multiplayer has been available for some time, the 1.5 update will allow players on PC to take advantage of four-player split-screen. Console players might be limited to two players initially. Better start rounding up those farming friends! Yeehaw! It's time now for the extra school! Now, it may be Mario's 35th anniversary, but Luigi also appears to be getting in on the fun, as Super Mario Bros. 35 players discovered a special Easter egg. It appears that holding down the L button while starting up a new match enables you to play as Luigi. Reportedly, you must have reached star rank 100 first, with some players suggesting you must have also unlocked and completed every stage in the game too for this to be possible. In any case, L is real indeed. Take the L! Now that brings us to the end of another gaming news scoop. <laughs> See you next time! <laughs> now that's out of the way, I can get back to my noob juice stabilization research. Maybe if I tweak the mustard to custard ratios, I'll carry the one. No! Oh, oh, we're still rolling, aren't we? <laughs> it's time to get the Woolala Lowdown on Age of Empires 3 Definitive Edition. are shelling the colony.
released in 2005, Age of Empires 3 is, as the name suggests, the third installment in the Age of Empires series. These games are regarded as classics and some of the best in the real-time strategy genre. The definitive edition is a remaster of the original game, with all the previous expansions included and some new content. There's plenty of game modes and challenges on offer, but throughout them, the core gameplay remains the same. You use villagers to collect resources to build your base. There are trees to chop, farms to harvest, and gold to mine. If you're lucky, you can even go fishing for whales, which give you money. Oh, I love whales. The animal, not the country. It's then time to train your army of various troop classes so that you can defeat your enemies and be victorious. Each time you level up, you can also send yourself shipments from your hometown, beefing up your colony with useful units and upgrades. These hometown cities can also be customized, but it's not very exciting. Oh, a new cosmetic for my cathedral. Hang on a minute. Is it just me or are these exactly the same? The game offers three lengthy story campaigns to play through, which give you different scenarios that mix things up a bit. You'll take on missions such as destroying the Fountain of Youth before it can fall into the wrong hands. We've done it! Or capturing supply wagons as your only mean of resources. Come on. I'm usually a fan of playing these games nice and slowly, building up a big base and an even bigger army. But the story campaigns encourage you to try different strategies. They're well-crafted, if a bit easy, and give you a varied experience. You can also play mini challenges, which test your skills and help teach you to be better at the game. Or historical battles, which recreate famous events. I don't know how accurate these are because I'm not much of a history buff myself, but they were still a bit of fun and flair, and it's a chance to play as a bunch of civilizations. They're all similar but different, with units that fill the same kind of roles but tweaked to fit each style. Each civilization also has differing perks. For example, instead of building houses that only increase the population cap, the Japanese build shrines, which also produce a small amount of resources. It's really cool, and especially shines in the freeform skirmish mode, which is my personal absolute favorite way to play. You get to choose a civilization that suits your playstyle. It's fun seeing all the civilization's different looks and way of doing things. Those soldiers, they're Russian. Well, tell them to slow down. But they've also tweaked quite a few things about how various civilizations are shown. Back in 2005, it was common for there to be inaccurate and stereotypical representations of certain people, particularly indigenous communities. And much to the developer's credit, they've used this opportunity to set the record straight. When you first boot the game, it has a message about the steps they've taken and ways the gameplay has been changed. These changes feel seamless, with the core of the game remaining the same, whilst being more accurate and respectful. This is super cool, and I'm really glad the developers made those changes and put them front and centre. I think there's still a few funny things in there, but I'm a big advocate of being nice, having fun and keeping on gaming. And making games more respectful is a big part of being nice. The Definitive Edition also tweaks the game with fresh graphics and music, which is done well, and an array of user interface choices. But things can still feel sluggish or unpolished at times. A bit of a shame to define the game with that. You know, I have played and loved all of the Age of Empires games, with two always being the absolute standout. With Definitive Editions now out for all three games, I feel like that judgment still stands. Small differences in gameplay, such as villagers not needing to carry resources back to a hub for them to be collected, makes 3 feel like a more forgiving game. But the hometown and shipment system of 3 also makes it feel more complex. Less challenge, yet a bit more confusion doesn't put 3 at the top, but it's still a solid bit of fun. I'm giving Age of Empires 3 Definitive Edition 3.5 out of 5 rubber chickens. Okay, it's Ask SP time. We've got questions and they need answers like I need cheese toasties. A lot and many of them. Ooh. 
Anyway, let's crack on with this video from Charlie. Hi GGSP, Darren decided to come on holiday with me and I've got two questions. One, do you think I should wait to get the new Switch or not? And two, have you played Brawl Stars and if so, what would you rate it? Thanks, bye. Oh wow, I didn't know Darren went on holiday. Better call him real quick. Hello, Darren speaking. Hey, Darren, are you on holiday with Charlie? And more importantly, why didn't you invite me? Take a look. Oh, negative. That's not me. It's merely a cardboard cutout, as it were. This cardboard, Darren, is a reasonable likeness, uh, but lacks my particular je ne sais quoi. Right! Yeah, no, 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 of course. I, I knew that. <laughs> While I've got you here, though, Darren, what do you think of Charlie's Switch dilemma? Should he wait for the new Switch model to come out? Well, of course, that is a decision for you and your grown-ups, Charlie. But considering we have heard strong indications there will be a new Switch model next year, it may be worthwhile waiting for more official details to be revealed about it at least. Then you and your grown-ups can weigh everything up. You might like to consider what games will be available for it, the differences between its features and those of the original Switch model, the cost, how it compares to other platforms, and so on. Information is power, after all. <laughs> hmm, right, well, apart from the maniacal laughter at the end there, Darren, that sounds pretty reasonable. Well, thanks a bunch. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Right, well, as for Brawl Stars, I have dabbled a little bit in this formidable fighting game. I like how they've taken the online multiplayer game format and really made it work well for mobile. It's pretty fun, but I haven't played enough to give it a rubber chicken score. It's probably best to save the rubber chickens for games we do full reviews of. Moving on now, and we have a video from Bridget. GGSP, I got two questions for you. One, will Minecraft get any updates? And two, will Pokemon Sun and Moon come out for any PC? Thank you. Thanks, Bridget. To your first question, yes, Minecraft will be receiving new updates. In fact, there's a new major themed update called Caves and Cliffs coming up. I'm not sure exactly when it will launch, but I'd guess sometime next year. And I imagine there will be more updates to come after this too. But to your second question, I'm highly doubtful Pokemon Sun and Moon will come to PC in any official way. I think most of the major Pokemon games will continue the trend of releasing on Nintendo platforms. Though there are some spin-off games that are also on mobile, like Pokemon Go and Pokemon Cafe Mix, for example. But if you like Pokemon, you might want to have a look at Temtem, which is a very similar kind of game that's available on PC. Though it's still in early access at the moment, so not fully complete just yet. You might also enjoy something like Ooblets, which is also available for PC and a whole lot of adorable fun. Now, I think we have time for one more video, and this one comes to us from Tom and Harry. Hi, GGSP. We have two questions for you today. One, do your kids in Stardew Valley ever grow up? Two, what, in, what indie mobile games would you recommend for mobile? P.S. Darren, do these. Oh, wow, more Darren stuff. He really is a popular bot today. I'll get him on the line. Hello. Is that you again, Jem? Hey, Darren, some emoticons for you, if you would please. Oh, excellent. <clears> Hi, <throat> huh. alert. Smug. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks a bunch again, Darren. You're most welcome. <gasps> bye bye. Bye. So, on to your first question about whether your kids in Stardew Valley will ever grow up. Well, currently, your Stardew kids will only age up to toddler stage, otherwise known as stage four, for now at least. I guess it's possible Concerned Ape could decide to change this in a future update, but I've seen no solid indication of that at this time. But as for your second question, there are heaps of great indie mobile games to choose from. I'd recommend the gorgeous puzzlers Monument Valley 1 and 2, as well as the kiddie adventure game Cat Quest. Aww. Oh, and the heartfelt and artfelt Gree. And if you're up for a challenge, there's the roguelike space strategy of Faster Than Light. Or maybe you'd like some of the quirky Amanita design games, like Machinarium and Chuchel. And I know if Rad were here, she'd recommend the Trainline Sim Mini Metro. And there are all sorts to choose from on Apple Arcade, if you have a compatible device. Like Mini Motorways, the sequel to Mini Metro, 
What the Golf, Sayonara Wild Hearts, Projection First Light, I could go on and on. Though remember that Apple Arcade is a subscription service, so make sure your grown-ups are aware of that first. Radio, looks like that's all the Ask SP time we have for this week. If you have a question for us, go here and send it in. And remember that any video that makes it onto the show will score some sweet GGSP loot. Now, about that cheese toasty, um, I feel like I've really earned it after such a thorough question answering session for these quizzical minds. Ooh, thank you. Mm, the best kind of cheese toasty is a post Ask SP toasty. <laughs> all for today. But if you just can't survive a whole week until your next taste of GGSP, then check out the ABC Me app for an extra snack size serve, where Jem will be training an army of monkeys to do her bidding in The Survivalists. The nicer portion of your neighbours are the monkeys you can recruit to help you out by bribing them with their favourite food. And oh boy, we've got a big one for you next week on the show. We've got an actual Xbox Series X sitting under our TV as we speak. So, of course, we'll be bringing you our full impressions. Plus, our first first look at the PlayStation 5. It's the start of a whole new era of gaming, and it all starts next week. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Rat right out. Jim out. We're out. <laughs> <laughs>